Now, uh, last but certainly not least, the Right Honourable Michael Portillo. Again, Michael probably needs little introduction. Once an important member of Tory governments during the 80s and 90s, I think he's now a media star. It's not how he would describe himself, it's how I'm describing myself. But what I like most from his biography is that, and I hope this is true, that he, he once appeared in a Ribena commercial. So obviously, forget all the politics, forget all the media work he's done. He once appeared in a Ribena commercial. Michael Portillo. Uh, well, Malcolm, thank you very much for making it so painfully clear to the audience I'm a man with an enormous political future behind me. Um, <laughs> You didn't mention the most important position I achieved in government, because at one time I was a future Prime Minister, uh, and I'm now a, a former future Prime Minister. Uh, we're rather a large number of uh, former future Prime Ministers, and we've formed ourselves into a little club of former future Prime Ministers. Very pleased to be able to tell you today that we just welcomed David Miliband as a new member. Uh, personally, I'm looking forward to welcoming Mr Ed Miliband as well, but um, could, could, could I say how great plan to APG actually how pathetically grateful I am to APG for inviting me here today and plucking me from the obscurity in which I normally uh, now exist. No, no, because seriously, had you invited me 15 years ago, my name was habitually in headlines. But my name now has only been in the headline once in the last uh, decade. It was, just, it was just running up to the last general election. There was some speculation that a cabinet minister might lose his or her seat in the general election. And the headline appeared, Will There Be a Portillo Moment at This General Election? Now, for those of you who don't know what uh, a Portillo Moment is, it's journalistic shorthand for a man eating a bucket full of shit in public. <laughs> because in the, uh, in the 1997 general election, uh, in the full glare of national publicity with all the television cameras of the country on me, I lost my seat in Parliament lost my uh, ministerial job, lost my chance of leading the Conservative Party, all gone in one humiliating moment. And this humili humiliating moment was subsequently voted by Channel 4 viewers and observed for readers their third favourite moment of the 20th century. Um, in that particular poll, I narrowly beat the assassination of President Ceausescu into fourth place, uh, something of which I feel uh, very, very proud. Um, but... but, uh, but uh, joking apart, uh, this, this is actually going to be the first uh, theme that I'm going to talk to you about, and the second theme will be a, a slightly different subject. But I, I did find myself in 1997, uh, having been uh, touted as being a future Prime Minister, uh, actually out on my ear. Uh, no place in Parliament, no chance of leading the Conservative Party, uh, and obviously my uh, career wrecked. Um, so that was uh, a moment in which I had to, I suppose, fight uh, against the odds. Uh, and I think the theme of this half of what I want to say to you is that um, it may be that the odds against you are not as great as they appear to be. Um, as I reflected upon uh, what had happened to me, the first thing was I was sort of hit by this uh, wall of hate uh, because um, there was such uh, jubilation about my defeat, jubilation about the defeat of the Conservatives, but huge jubilation about my defeat in a very sort of personal uh, way. Uh, it, perhaps to understand it a bit, you, you, you know, it, if you remember in the last couple of weeks when Margaret Thatcher died and uh, this record came out, um, what was it, ding dong, the witch is dead. I mean, it was that kind of, you know, feeling of sort of uh, revulsion and hatred that was around. And this was, first of all, a bit of a surprise to me. I had not understood uh, that this was um, the widespread public view of me. So that took a little bit of getting used to. But the word resilience has been used today. Uh, and in part, I reflected on, you know, whether this was um, justified. And uh, the last job that I'd done just before the general election of 1997 was I'd been the Secretary of State for Defence. So I understand the sort of people that Giles was talking about before, uh, military people with the most fantastic set of values and ethos and high standards of behaviour. Uh, and I had enjoyed two spectacular years with them. I very much enjoyed their, their company and their support. I'd been very pleased to be their political leader. And this had gone rather well. And so I felt a certain resilience. I thought, well, you know, I was doing that all right, so there must be something there that I can fall back on. I also felt, Giles would find this more difficult to understand, I, I did feel that during the period, the period that we've been in government, we've been in government for 18 years, that we had been doing what we thought were the right things. Uh, and it wasn't just our view, in a way, that we've been doing the things that were the right things. The things that we've been doing have been exported to the world in things like privatisation, which was invented here had been exported to the world, and the things that we've been doing, like privatisation, 
like reform with the trade unions, were bought into by our successors. When Tony Blair came in in 1997, he, he, he pretty much uh, adopted the suite of policies that we had been pursuing. So that, was, that, was, uh, that offered me some resilience as well. And the third thing was, I thought about really what my friends thought about me. It, it so happens that most of the friends I have, no, maybe that's an exaggeration, but many of the friends I have are friends that I had in school days and friends that I had in university days. And these have been very enduring friendships. And so there are a lot of people who have known me over a very long period of time. Uh, and I wanted to check with my friends uh, whether I was really, you know, what kind of a person I was. And um, although I think a lot of my friends didn't enjoy my public persona when I was a politician, um, I think they didn't think that my private persona had changed. They didn't think that I had been, as it were, corrupted by power. Uh, however, it wasn't all just about kind of reassuring myself. I also engaged in quite a long process of uh, analysis about what had gone wrong in quite a public way, made quite a lot of speeches and wrote quite a lot of articles about what had happened to the Conservative Party and what the Conservative Party needed to do. I was, in that sense, still very politically minded because I was thinking about what the Conservative Party needed to do to get back into uh, office one day, although I thought that would be a very long way in the future. But I think, in, the way, in a way, the most important thing that happened to me was something uh, external. Uh, and this is perhaps what I want to uh, put into your minds. I assume that this entire discussion that we're having about fighting against the odds is uh, posited in the context of uh, being within the United Kingdom, which is uh, a very particular place. It, it's not the only place where what I'm about to say is true, but it is a place where what I'm going to say is very true. And that is that there is an extraordinary uh, tolerance and an extraordinary liberalism about the United Kingdom. We've already heard quotes today from Plato and David Hume, and I'm going to add uh, John Stuart Mill, the, the, the father of liberty. John Stuart Mill said, if all the world think one thing and one man think another, then it is absolutely wrong for all the world to try and silence the one man. Partly for reasons of pure tolerance, that you should not oppress uh, an individual. <clears throat> but also from the practical point of view, that all the world might be wrong and the one person might be right. And I think this actually permeates um, our society and the way in which we deal with each other. Um, we accept the possibility that if all the world is saying one thing and one person says another, that it's possible that the one person is right and all the world is wrong. And this translates its way through in all sorts of ways. Uh, typically, when you're in politics, what happens is um, the media builds you up. Uh, and, of course, you enjoy this process of being built up. But they have an agenda, which is that they're looking forward to the moment when they built you up, that they can then tear you down. However, that is not where the process ends. The, um, the media in this country is also then interested in recovery. The media is also interested in the comeback kid, the comeback story. Uh, and that is something uh, to be, very much to be borne in mind. And so... Oh, and, and sorry, let me say one other thing about the way in which you rise in politics. One of the ways you rise in politics is that um, you, certain, you say something, you do something, which attaches a label to you. And the label, by degrees, is built up into a pigeonhole. Uh, and what this means is that all information that reinforces the stereotype which exists about you is fed into the pigeonhole. And all information that does not conform to the stereotype is thrown away. And therefore, the only information that is allowed into the public domain about you is information that reinforces the stereotype. So at one point, I became uh, stereotyped as being a right winger. All information that suggested that this was true was given a lot of publicity. And any information that might suggest that this was untrue was thrown away. Now, it's very useful when you're on the way up to have a pigeonhole. It's very useful that you're recognised for something, that your name is attached to some brand, as John would say. But after a while, it's also very constraining. And I suppose, really, the process that I've been involved in since I left politics is the demolition of the pigeonhole, or perhaps more accurately, the construction of a broader pigeonhole. Because given that there is this tolerance of minority opinion, that people are interested in argument, are interested in minority views, are interested in contrarians. I very much like John's word contrarian. 
I now regard myself as largely a contrarian. I like saying things that I haven't heard other people say. And this has become, again, a, a sort of brand, at least the work that I still do on, on politics. I do other gentler work, uh, which is about taking people around Britain on railway trains and introducing them to Victorian Britain. But in as much as I'm still involved in controversy, that, that is the case. So, in our very tolerant society, it is absolutely possible to reinvent yourself. And I think we should all give great thanks for that. But the second thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the characteristics of uh, Margaret Thatcher's government. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of politics, so let me just um, assure you that when she came to office in 1979, it very much seemed as though the odds were stacked uh, against her. There are a number of things that she set out to do, um, deal with the problem of the uh, overmighty trade unions, uh, try to increase Britain's sense of pride in itself, make the country more productive, uh, encourage entrepreneurship, things which were absolutely considered to be impossible. I mean, for example, in those days, no one could imagine how a government wouldn't set the level of people's incomes and pay rises and how a government wouldn't set the level of, of prices and price increases. I mean, you, those of you who are young won't be able to believe that governments ever thought they could control incomes and prices. But in the 1970s, it was absolutely taken for granted that that was what the government was there to do, control incomes and prices. And so for, for a government to come along and say, no, we're not going to control incomes and prices, for example, or we really do think we can reform the trade unions, this was absolutely against the odds. There were very, very few people who would believe that this was true or that it was possible. Uh, how was progress made with this? Well, partly because there was a battle of ideas, and the battle of ideas had been going on for a, a very long period. That is to say, there were individuals, charismatic individuals, and there were to some extent think tanks, but particularly individuals, who dared to write things that challenged the norm, that said there is a different way of doing things. And some of these people would go around and they would lecture, they would go to universities, they would try to change the world view. And one of the reasons that I'm attracted, it's now history, but one of the reasons I'm attracted to this period of history is that it was about ideas. Ideas really mattered. And there were ideologies. There was a socialist ideology and there was a conservative ideology and they were in opposition to each other. And it was, you know, it was a fascinating uh, and highly productive time. I think the United States now has more of this than we do. They have a polarization of view, which in some ways is very negative, but in some ways is actually very exhilarating. But perhaps one of the most important points I want to say about Margaret Thatcher's government was that there was a very small group of people who thought the same way and thought they could change everything. And I think this group was only about five people from what I remember. It was Margaret Thatcher, uh, it was Nigel Lawson, it was Geoffrey Howe, it was Sir Keith Joseph, it was sort of Michael Hazeltine, but not really. But a group of people who together, who breathed the same air, ideologically speaking, who were absolutely joined at the hip, there wasn't a cigarette paper between them. And they, together, could make things happen. And I, I think um, teams like this are... Uh, it's not been so much mention of teamwork today, but I think teams like this are vitally important. Margaret Thatcher's way of proceeding, of course, was that she had extremely strong beliefs. The thing I've always really envied her for, I think I envy her for this, is that she never had to think, what do I think? She knew what she thought about everything. Giles and I do a, a radio show together quite often. It's called The Moral Maze. And they, they put to us a, a moral dilemma that we have to debate. And the first thing I have to do is I have to think to myself, what do I think about this? I don't know whether Giles has to, probably less so than I do. I, I have to think, what do I think about this? Margaret Thatcher never had to think what she thought about anything. Now, probably you only have that, or you either have that or you don't. But anyway, she was absolutely sure what she thought. <laughs> However, her way of proceeding was not, as some people think, a bull in a china shop. She knew where she was going. This takes us back to the metaphor of the compass and the map. 
She knew where she was going. She knew the direction in which she wanted to go. But she couldn't always get there by the shortest route. And so she would tack and she would compromise. People forget this now. This is partly because she, she had such a, an overwhelming personal propaganda about never, never being swayed from her course. Ha! Absolute rubbish. She was often swayed from her course. But when she was swayed from her course, she would sooner or later return to the course. And by the way, all of us who worked in her organization knew what it was about. We didn't have to think. We knew what it was about. And I'll give an example of that. Civil servants always put to ministers propositions. That a problem has arisen. They need to know from ministers what their policy is to be. So it's a bit like one of these experiments you did at school. You know, the, the first thing is they set out the problem. The second thing is they set out three possible solutions. And the, the, the third thing is they set out a recommendation. So with Margaret Thatcher, here's the problem. There are three possible solutions, A, B, C. We assume that ministers will want to do A because it is consistent with government policy. When John Major became Prime Minister after Margaret Thatcher, it was as though we were on a liner crossing the Atlantic and someone had switched off the engines. And suddenly we were simply wallowing in the sea. No sense of direction. And of course, by the way, if you're thinking of this in military terms, Giles, you know, once, you're, once you switch the engines off, you are an easy target. You are no longer breaking the waves. All the shells can be uh, aimed at you with perfect accuracy. And that's where we were. And then the civil servants would say, Minister, there's this issue here. Here are three possible solutions, A, B, C. Which would ministers like to do? No longer any presumption as to what we were going to do because there was a clear, consistent government policy. It took courage. But I want to tell you a story about the, um, the end of Margaret Thatcher, and that will, I think, bring me to the end of my remarks, because I made this point about the, constructing the team. After a while, of course, the team fell apart. And as the team fell apart, everything fell apart. Um, so the end of Margaret Thatcher was she, uh, uh, the end of her premiership, she was challenged for the leadership of the Conservative Party by Michael Heseltine, who had been a senior minister in her cabinet, but was now on the back benches. And Margaret Thatcher, unfortunately, had developed a personal contempt for Michael Heseltine. And when he challenged her for the leadership of the party, all she could feel was a contempt for the challenge. And she felt the only way of dealing with this psychologically was to pretend that the challenge wasn't happening and to continue to be prime ministerial. In these days, the only people who voted for the leader of the party were the Conservative members of Parliament, about 350 of them. So it was quite a short election campaign over a few days. On the Friday, she was being prime ministerial in Northern Ireland. She was over there with the troops. On the Monday and the Tuesday of the following week, she was being prime ministerial at a uh, mega conference, a summit meeting in Paris. And in her absence, in her absence, the vote was taken in the House of Commons and she didn't get enough votes to win and she came back that there would be another ballot but there would be more names on the ballot paper she came back on the Wednesday and she asked her cabinet to go to see her one by one and each member of her cabinet some cheerfully some very sadly said to her the game was up and she had to resign I wasn't yet in the cabinet but uh, I got in to see her that afternoon had a one-to-one -one meeting with her, and I told her that she should not resign. And she said, well, that's very surprising to me. I don't understand this. All my cabinet has told me to resign. Why would you think I shouldn't resign? I said, because the electorate in this election is 350. You know them all. Many of them you've known for 20 or 30 years. You have not canvassed a single one of them. You haven't picked up the telephone to one of them. You haven't asked one of them for his or her vote. And I believe that even now... If you ask them to come in one by one and you look them in the eye and, told them they're going to, and ask them to tell you to your face that they're going to vote against you, half of them would be carried out of this room in tears. And she looked at me with an extraordinary look, which has stayed with me ever since. The look was, it told me, that she'd never even thought of doing this. This woman was an election-winning machine. She'd won three general elections on the trot. She was never defeated by the British people. But when it came to saving her job, she failed to mount any sort of campaign. And so, somehow along the way, she had lost this sense 
not only of the team, because the five people that I mentioned, they were scattered to the four winds, they'd all gone um, from her government, uh, most of them in, in circumstances of great um, bitterness, uh, but also she'd forgotten that she depended on a party and she'd forgotten to use her gifts and her charisma and so on. And there is something very, very isolating, I think, about high office. I could tell you lots of stories about what happens in the isolation of high office. But one of the things that happens in the isolation of high office is you, there's a tendency for you to forget the basics about how the thing works. And the thing works through a whole lot of people. Um, enough from me, I, except that I was provoked by Malcolm, uh, who, who mentioned something about a show called uh, This Week. Uh, it is true that I do a show on Thursday nights called This Week. It's been running for more than 10 years, and it is true that for most of that period, uh, I shared a sofa that was far too small for us with Diane Abbott. And what some people don't know is that Diane Abbott and I were at school together. Uh, and so how can I put this delicately? You know, we, we, uh, we shared a certain amount of emotional baggage, you know. We, uh, what are you trying to say? We, we, <laughs> we knew where the bodies were buried, if you get my meaning. And so there were Diane and I, you know, stuck together. I should say this program is extremely late at night. So there we were stuck together on this sofa that was far too small for us in the middle of the night, surrounded by our emotional baggage. We knew no one was watching. Uh, and, and in these circumstances, we did tend to get a little, bit a little bit tactile. So I would put my arm around Diane and give her a bit of a squeeze. Diane always liked to rub my right knee. And we did uh, an audience survey, actually, and we discovered that our audience was 50% uh, insomniac and 50% uh, pervert. And I just want to thank all of you who are regular watchers. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>